Hi, I'm Gretchen Carlson, and I'm in studio with The Hollywood Reporter. Gretchen, thank you so much for coming in. This is so exciting to have you here. We have a lot of ground to cover. There's a lot going on with you I these know. days. You have a new special on Lifetime about the college admissions scandal. So, you know, there there's so many big headlines out there in the world, and I know that the your, your documentary series goes behind the headlines. Why did you choose the college admissions scandal? Because it's one of the biggest stories that's happening in America right now over the last several months. I think this documentary is one of the first to really go beyond the headlines and tell people the real story. And it's a fascinating topic, and we're going to be able to expose so much for viewers. It's going to help parents out there who are about to go through this process. But it's also going to make people angry, I think, about how the system has allegedly been rigged. And it's really about the haves and the have-nots. And I think that, you know, for a long time, people have been suspect of the admissions process. And we're really going to break it down for them and, and tell them probably what they were suspecting all along. One of the exclusive interviews that we have in the documentary is actually a mom who filed a $500 billion lawsuit against all the defendants in the admission scandal. Her claim is that she's filing on behalf of all of the students across America and the world who maybe didn't get into college because these slots were being given away illegally. And she says she's not doing it for her own personal gain of, of money, but for all of these kids that we may never know why they didn't get into college. I mean, the interesting thing is that colleges don't have to tell you when they deny you what the reason is, right? Mm -hmm. So was it because they were giving away these slots illegally, or is it just simply because they have too many applicants? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of unknown in there, but um, I think that, that hearing from this mom exclusively, she trusted me to tell her story for the first time, and I'm really proud of that. We also talked to a really amazing swimmer who had an encounter with Rick Singer, mm -hmm. who was the mastermind of this admission scandal. And quite honestly, his parents were working three, four jobs, and they couldn't afford to sign up for the tutoring. And we interviewed them for the first time exclusively, and they, you know, it's like a double-edged sword. They didn't have the money to do the tutoring, so they're grateful now because of the scandal that they didn't get involved. But at the same time, their son was never recruited to be a swimmer in college, so they have many question marks in the back of their minds about, well, why not? Is it because we didn't go with Rick Singer? Mm -hmm. And by the way, you should be proud of the, the entire special. I watched it, and it's and it was for somebody like me. I I paid attention to so many of the headlines and and obviously the celebrity of it all. But going deeper in the special really brought to light so many things that I had missed. Just just paying attention to sort of like the sensational aspect of it all. I mean, you really take a closer look at who Rick Singer is, which mm -hmm. I found really informative. Tell me what was most surprising to you about about this. Man. Well, how, you know, we actually focused on somebody saying positive things about him. That's true. Right? Yeah, I was because about it, that. it was very balanced yeah. and, and it was important to us to show how people can turn on a dime. And I think a lot of these parents fall into the same category. Listen, as a parent of two teenage children myself, we would do anything for our children. I think that's the prevailing thought process out there. But like Rick Singer and like these parents, there's a fine line between doing anything for your children and crossing over that line and doing something legal. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, there are consequences. And we're seeing that play out right now. I mean, look at these sentencings that are coming down for the people who agreed from very early on to plead guilty and be contrite and apologize. They're still going to jail. Mm -hmm. And so there are consequences in our nation when, when you break the law. And I think we also showcase how Rick Singer sort of followed that same path of being a, a good person, a basketball coach at a school, and then what switched in him to suddenly go to the dark side? Mm. Something. And then, you know, I, we could argue money. Um, that would probably be the prevailing thought process mm -hmm. because he allegedly earned $25 million in the process. Wow. Talk to me about what, what you think should happen to universities and college admission process in the wake of this? Two important points. We talked to a college admissions counselor who used to be head of admissions at a major university. Now she's on the other side counseling parents. And she says that there's no way that these institutions did not know that this was going on. That's the first thing. So are we going to be hearing about more indictments down the road? I would speculate yes. Um, number two, there are just a lot of loopholes that need to be closed that were just made it rife for this to be able to happen. Mm -hmm. And the biggest one that, that we uncovered was the idea that when you're recruited for a sport where they're not actually giving you a financial scholarship, you don't have to play that sport when you get to college. And I think that that is an unknown to a lot of Americans out there. They would assume that if you're recruited for sailing or for squash or for crew, that you're actually going to play that sport when you get there. 
Well, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. So that to me is this huge loophole that you can drive a huge truck through. Um, and one of the main things that Rick Singer attached himself to, to make this scandal work. One of the great things about having you here today is it's, you know, it's always great to talk to somebody about a big new project or about an interesting special or film or something, but, but the fact that you're sitting here today talking about something is, is that you're doing and working on is, is such a great example for, for women who have spoken out about sexual harassment or sexual misconduct in the workplace that you can still have a career. I know that that's been um, something that you've been so passionate about and you're a rare case because that's not the case for so many women. So talk to me about what, how it feels to still be working um, in the in the face of what you've gone through or in the wake of what you've gone through and and what other women should take from from seeing you uh, continue to work well thank you so much for asking that question because that's really what this whole movement is all mm -hmm. about you know when I jumped off the cliff by myself three years ago I didn't know that there would be any safety net below but really it was the fact that there were all these other women who had a shared experience with me that I didn't know about who started reaching out to me and really buoyed my spirits. Um, so then it was very important to me, I realized from them that most of them never went back to work wow. after they came forward. And, and that to me was outrageous. And so I was determined that I was gonna go back to what's been my passion for the last 25 years, which is television news. And I have then become a beacon of hope for all of these other women that if Gretchen Carlson could do this kind of you know, major case and go back to work in her chosen profession, then these women at home are saying to themselves, maybe I can too. Wow. And listen, over the last three years, I have gained great perspective. I have emerged from my lawsuit stronger and more empathetic to the stories that I've heard and the stories that I want to continue to cover. Mm -hmm. And there are tons of opportunities for me out there in television right now with the changing landscape every day mm -hmm. of what TV actually is. And I'm just grateful that I'm gonna probably take advantage of those opportunities and continue my career. What do you want to do for the next chapter or the next phase of your career? Because you have been also sort of a master of reinvention throughout your entire <laughs> career, yes. starting as a, a violin prodigy and then becoming Miss America and then, you know, becoming one of the faces of television news. So exactly. And it wasn't uh, like I was thinking to myself throughout that process that one day it's going to say on my resume, um, one of the major poster children for sexual harassment I mean, in the workplace. Right. But you know, if there's been one constant in my life, it's that I have a fire in my belly mm -hmm. to work. And whether that's philanthropically, which I have done over the last three years, and frankly for my entire life, whether that's speaking up for women, which I've done my whole life and continue to do, whether that's changing laws on the Hill, which I've been fighting for for the last three years, or whether it's me myself going back to work, that fire in my belly never leaves me. So yes, I have a passion to sit behind the anchor desk again, whether it's cable news or at a network, or to do a talk show, um, or to bring the country together as we approach a very important election in 2020 as a unifying force. You know, I have a tremendous amount still to offer in my career that I've worked so hard to attain. And what news are you watching? Because I, I read something that you're not watching Fox News are at you shocked? all. <laughs> I mean, I'm not shocked, no. Yeah. But um, but there is a lot of news out there. So what, what are you watching on a daily basis? You know, it's been really rewarding for me to be able to watch a lot of everything. Yeah. You know, where I finally had a little bit of time to sit back and watch all of my colleagues, and I'm really proud of all of them. I mean, you as well. You know, we all work really hard every day, and I never really had a chance to sit back and really honor that. And so, for example, I'm rooting for Nora O'Donnell, who's, you know, back as a woman doing the CBS Evening News. I'm rooting for Jake Tapper, who participated in my book, Be Fierce, as a feminist dad and, and man. Um, and I've really just gained so much more perspective from, from being able to see a lot of everything. What I recommend to people in this hyper-partisan time that we live in, unfortunately, is that you watch something at least one hour a week that you don't agree with. Wow. Because then maybe there's a way to bring us together and find solutions in our country um, instead of just staying in our lanes and never looking outside of it and watching only what we want to hear. Mm -hmm. 
um, that's such good advice and something that I'm going to now do. Okay, uh, uh, good. I want to go Report back, back to you yeah, what I will, you think. I will. And um, I want to go back to something you said, though, too, because you have been up on the hill fighting because um, it didn't matter how long I prepared or how many questions I wrote down. There's so much you still can't talk about, yeah. about, about your own personal journey. And you're, you're fighting so that that's not the case for women and they have their day in court and they're not stuck in these forced arbitrations. So talk to me about what that path has been like for you. Yeah, thank you for the question. So when I usually talk about arbitration, I get like this glazed over look from people in the audience because unfortunately, we don't really know what that means. So simplistically, it means taking the muzzle off of women, taking the handcuffs off to give them a voice if they happen to face harassment in the workplace. Simply put, tons of companies now make you sign employment contracts that have these arbitration clauses that mean if you do have a dispute, you have to go to arbitration and not an open court. Mm -hmm. And the problem with arbitration is that it's a secret chamber. Mm -hmm. So it's a way where companies have been able to shield harassment cases from becoming public, quite honestly, over the last 20 years. They just shove them all to arbitration and the woman goes there, maybe gets a small little settlement, settlement never works again. And the worst part about it is that the perpetrator gets to stay on the job because nobody knows about it. Mm. And so that promulgates this harassing to continue in that environment. Wouldn't it be great if my bill would pass and women would be able to stand up and speak up and be able to tell their stories? And quite honestly, it would probably stop the perpetrators from doing the harassment if they knew the woman had a voice. Mm. So I believe that passing this into law is the final part of the tipping point in our society to really eradicate this problem from the workplace. It's really important. And, and I'm going to share with you that it's really moving um, quickly now on the Hill. And I'm very optimistic that something good is going to come about this before the end of the year. Wow, that's good. Um, and then because you, it's also so important to you because your story is being told. Mm -hmm. um, so many people have, have caught Naomi Watts's uh, interpretation of your story in the loudest voice on Showtime. and then. You know, here comes another Oscar winner and Nicole Kidman doing <laughs> the same thing. I know you've, you've met Naomi, but have you met Nicole, Nicole or had any conversations? You're not allowed to, right? No. No? You know, it's really strange and frustrating because of my NDA, the non-disclosure. I can't participate in any of these projects. Mm. And sometimes people don't understand that or know that. But again, it's why I'm working so hard on the Hill to change that. I had a chance to meet Naomi after she was done filming The Loudest Voice when I was at the premiere. And what I was really touched by was her Instagram post after that, where you know she really said that playing me as a character was one of the highlights of her career. Oh, wow. And that she was just, you know, shouting from the mountaintops my, my bravery. And I'll never forget that because how surreal is it to have Naomi and Nicole playing little Gretchen Carlson from Anoka, Minnesota, right? Um, it's just, it's very surreal. And, and I'm very honored because I think it just continues the dialogue of this issue, which is essential to fixing it. And if it helps one other woman to get the fact that courage is contagious and watch these projects and get the courage to come forward, then these projects are extremely beneficial, even if I can't participate in them. Wow, yeah, that's well said. Um, and it's uh, it's inescapable, too. I mean, it's one thing to see the headlines like we're seeing today with Matt Lauer, um, the latest headlines from Ronan Farrow's book, but then to forget that there's there's a woman behind those stories, mm -hmm. or there's multiple women behind these stories. So, But I did want to ask you about today's headlines. It, it just is another... Uh, set of allegations that he's facing and it brings the glare back to like the news business and the media business and what's really going on um, behind the scenes. How pervasive do you think it is and, and what's your take on this latest wave with Matt Lauer? Well first of all that's a lot of emotions for me every time that you see a big story like this break because it brings it brings it back to me and the courage that it took to jump off the cliff before we were in what I like to call this cultural revolution where um, it's safer for women to come forward because we're actually being believed. You know, so there's a ton of emotions for me and the first thought I have is not necessarily about Matt Lauer but about the victim. And I just want to let her know that she's not alone and that there are thousands of women all across the country who are, are here and men to lift her up and support her and make her feel like she's not alone because I know how difficult it was for her to decide to put a name and face on this. Um, and then also, I just like to remind people that sexual harassment is not only happening in Hollywood and with famous TV news people. 
This is an epidemic that's happening to tons of people across our country in every profession. Teachers, lawyers, members of our military. I had an airline mechanic reach out to me. Um, Wall Street bankers, doctors, police officers, fire chiefs. It's everywhere. And that's really why I've continued to do all the work that I'm doing. It's not for me anymore. It's for all of these other women who never had a voice. And it's also for my children and for other people's children because we need to get this message to the young people to help stop the process. And I'm really hopeful uh, when I go speak across college campuses that I see as many young men in the audiences wanting to come and hear me speak as I do women. And that gives me great hope. Wow. Um, we're running out of time, but I did want to ask you too, you've also been spreading the message through your books. Uh, it feels like there's a trilogy here. I don't know. There's two already. <laughs> there's two already. Are you planning a third or is that of interest to you? You know, writing books are, um, actually writing books is the easy part. Promoting the books <laughs> is the hard part. Is, is the hard part. Yeah. The industry's just changed so dramatically over the last couple of years. Uh, but yes, I probably will be writing another book, but not tomorrow. Not tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get back on TV first, yes, um, like and, you and are. Pass this, my bill and pass your bill as you are this weekend. So check out Gretchen Carlson's new special on Lifetime, October twelfth, about the college admission scandal. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.